Throughout recorded history, mankind has dreamt of building the perfect society, an empire that might somehow satisfy the needs of every man. An ancient legend cast the shadows of one such society that is said to have existed long ago. 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato set down a dialogue called the Critias. He recounted the story of an ancient Greek poet and statesman named Solon. Solon had journeyed to Egypt in search of wisdom to help the government of his beloved Greece. The Greeks had been beset with factions and troubles, so Solon took counsel from the priests of the city of Sais. An old priest told him, O oh, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are never anything but children. There is no old opinion handed down among you, nor any science that is white with age. The old priest then proceeded to tell him the story of the lost city of Atlantis. In the centuries that would follow, scholars and researchers have debated whether Plato's Atlantis was intended to be an account of real history or simply an allegorical myth. Some even suggest that Atlantis was really the antediluvian world, the wicked society destroyed by the wrath of God in the great flood of Noah. In the 20th century, Plato's account was further supported by Masonic philosopher Manly P. Hall. Hall claimed that Atlantis had once been a vast and mighty empire that extended to the whole world, a philosophic commonwealth of nations that one day was destined to be rebuilt. But who would rebuild it? And exactly who was Manly P. Hall? Manly P. Hall was probably the most highly esteemed occultist and Freemason of the 20th century. Uh, he uh, understood the secrets of the ages long before he ever joined the Masons. Was really the foremost authority on the occultist side of Freemasonry, the deep, dark uh, side of Freemasonry, the one that most Masons never ascend to. I can't really think of anybody close to him. Manny P. Hall was the, the, one of the leading uh, people within this whole other world that we talk about. Hall authored over 200 books and is said to have given some 8,000 lectures on ancient philosophy. He is perhaps most remembered for his contribution to the mysterious brotherhood of Masonry. Upon his death in 1990, the Scottish Rite Journal, a Masonic publication, noted that he was often called, quote, Masonry's greatest philosopher. Among his teachings was that contained in Masonry and all the secret orders was the ancient wisdom of lost Atlantis. Hall wrote that for more than 3,000 years, secret societies had been laboring to create a background of knowledge necessary to the establishment of an enlightened democracy among the nations of the world. According to Hall, these societies could be traced back to ancient Egypt and had for centuries known of a secret place hidden from the eyes of common men, a place that would one day be revealed. In the 17th century, as settlers were colonizing the New World, Sir Francis Bacon, the leader of secret societies in England, set down his classic work, The New Atlantis. While archaeologists and treasure hunters have searched the globe looking for the lost continent, 400 years ago, Bacon, like many of his contemporaries, believed that Atlantis was America itself. Well, Bacon, to me, was really uh, fundamental uh, in, in the American colonizational scheme and its connection to the, the new Atlantis concept. He was trying to lay a foundation for uh, what could be accomplished uh, in the new world. While the Atlantis of Plato was a mighty empire known for the philosophy of its kings, Bacon would write of a nation governed by scientific achievement, filled with marvels and wonders never before seen. 
Bacon was talking about this new nation, talking about submarines, talking about unimaginable weapons of war, talking about flying machines and tall buildings. I, how did he come into possession of this knowledge? Did Francis Bacon outline the course of the new world before its time? And if so, by what power was he inspired to do so? While there are no states or cities that bear his name, his mysterious influence has compelled some to call him the real and true founder of America. His founding of America was really through other people who were following his work, following his, the program he'd laid out. Bacon was the head of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. He had a huge influence through being the chief of the Rosicrucian fraternity at the time. He had huge influence on the birth of modern Freemasonry. And many of those Rosicrucians actually went into Freemasonry at that time to lift it up to its, its new level. And Freemasonry has a major influence on the founding of America. While many of the early settlers came to work the land for the cause of religious freedom, there were with them secret societies who came to the New World with another agenda. Secret societies came to America shortly after the pilgrims arrived, and they were sent by a man named Sir Francis Bacon. You get this, this very strange mixture of people, many of whom understood even then the advantage, uh, spiritually and otherwise, to having secret orders Unless you understand the influence of the occult societies uh, on the development of America, on the establishment of America, upon the course of America, why you get completely lost in our history. And they were the ones through which this work was being put into operation in England, in Europe, and eventually in America and the world. So that America then could be used to lead the world uh, into the philosophic empire. You understand that America was founded by Christians as a Christian nation. However, there were always those people on the other side who wanted to use America, use our military power and our financial power to establish enlightened democracies throughout the world and restore lost Atlantis. Yeah, maybe Bacon had it right. Maybe uh, Atlantis is not something yet to occur, but maybe it's occurring right now in America. In his lifetime, Sir Francis Bacon referred to himself as the herald of a new age. He promoted a new universal order for the whole world. Can this be what early American founders referred to with the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages? And does this vision affect America today? When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. As America marches forward, spreading democracy throughout the globe, is she merely promoting freedom or fulfilling an ancient plan? Is she following a course planned for centuries by men who believe she is chosen for a secret destiny? To understand the present, and possibly the future, we look into the past as we unfold the secret mysteries of America's beginnings. Can America be the new Atlantis? The movie National Treasure revealed to many the role of Freemasons in the founding of America. Often seen as a shadowy organization with hidden agendas, Masonry was portrayed in a positive light. Was this coincidence or could there have been something behind it? I think there's probably a little something behind it. The Freemasons among our founding fathers left us clues like these, the unfinished pyramid, the all-seeing eye, they're speaking to us through these. 
Well, the movie National Treasure is probably the first film in many years that has, has given a positive spin to the Masonic Lodge. Uh, and, and essentially, it seems to have been at least partially designed as kind of a propaganda piece for them. They were basically trying to say that this, these people who have hidden the secret knowledge of whatever it was, the, the gold stash or whatever, are ba the Masons, are basically good guys. Because it makes them appear to be this sort of benign, shadowy group that's in the background protecting these important ancient secrets and also protecting this great massive treasure. It was, it was fairly accurate in its Masonic elements. You can tell whoever made the film either, either was a Mason, and of course there's a lot of Masons in Hollywood, uh, or else had done a lot of research. Screenwriter Jim Kauf, who developed the storyline for Disney Pictures, claims no Masonic connection. Yet some researchers are not convinced. Masons were involved in the writing of that, it seems to me, because then they tried to turn it around and you know, say that this, uh, that Freemasonry is a good thing, that it has these hidden secrets deep within it and that someday will be revealed and, you know, bring good things to America, etc. Yet did the filmmakers accurately portray the real secrets of Masonry? The thing I think that's unfortunate about the movie is other than it kind of glamorizes the Masons, is that it makes it sound like the treasure of Masonry is monetary that it's this enormous cachet of wealth and gold and jewels and urns and statues and whatever. And really that's not what the treasure of masonry is. Uh, the treasure of masonry is esoteric wisdom. It is, and it is what masons believe, it is the secret of eternal life and immortality. Uh, and that's an entirely different thing. Conspiracy theorists have suggested that the film was intended to mislead. But the question remains, if Masons were involved in the making of the film, what would motivate them to tell a story about a society sworn to secrecy? I think Masons have been pretty desperate over the last uh, couple decades. They've taken a lot of hits, due uh, in at least part to my books and their uh, membership is declining fast. Men love secrets, and that's just a basic truism. And so if they advertise that through a popular movie, uh, you know, maybe it would generate a little more interest. On one level, uh, the film, I think it does some good in that it does educate people about the origins of our country and the fact that the origins of our country was very much steeped in masonry. But on the other hand, I think it misleads about the benign nature of Masonry's involvement. Uh, and also it misleads by defining the, the nature of what Masonry has been guarding for the last 3,000 years. But what has Masonry been guarding for the last 3,000 years? The real history of the craft, as it is called, varies from one source to another and is a continued thorn of controversy. Masons claim biblical origins dating back to Tubal Cain, the first craftsman, as well as Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel and founded the ancient city of Babylon. King Solomon plays an important role, as Masons are said to have been the builders of the great temple in Jerusalem. No less important is the influence of Gnosticism, sometimes called the mother of Masonry. According to Masonic historian Albert Mackey, Gnosticism is where Masonry gets the mysterious letter G, as seen here in the midst of the Masonic square and compass, a symbol that often adorns Masonic tombstones. Known for rejecting the biblical gospels, the Gnostics claim to be the real Christians, an issue the apostles spoke vehemently against in the New Testament. The Gnostic Gospels have been promoted by writers like Elaine Pagels and celebrities such as Jane Fonda. It was the Gnostic teachings that formed the heart of Dan Brown's blockbuster book, The Da Vinci Code. The Gnostics were known to express a humanistic view of Christ, a view they are said to have exploited for the purpose of justifying their debauchery of women. 
Hence, the tales of Jesus and his alleged relationship with Mary Magdalene, a view often attributed to the Gnostics and repeated in Brown's controversial book. But Masonry's most popular debates, especially with films like National Treasure and books such as The Da Vinci Code, Born in Blood and Holy Blood, Holy Grail, seem to involve the mysterious Knights Templar, whose connection to Freemasonry is often seen at the Rossland Chapel in Scotland's capital city of Edinburgh. A place that not only reveals much about the Templars and Masonry, but within may be secrets to the founding of the new world. But whatever the connection or controversy, most Masons trace their craft back to the mysteries of ancient Egypt. Egypt is like pretty much the proximate fountainhead of all esoteric mystery teaching. After the example of the Egyptian craftsmen, the Masons carved their own imagery in the great structures of Europe. Secret signs and symbols were embedded into their work, the meaning of which was to be hidden from outsiders. These were the craft Masons who actually built the temples. If you look at European architecture, you know those, all those big cathedrals in Europe, Cologne Cathedral in Germany, uh, Notre Dame in Paris, Salisbury Cathedral in England, all those beautiful cathedrals were all built around the 1200s and 1300s. And it was these Masons who knew their business and they wanted to keep their skills secret. All the great cathedrals of Europe were built by stonemasons who had an understanding of esoteric lore, and they're basically riddles in stone. When masons came to America, they practiced their trade in the same way they had in Europe, embedding secret codes within the design and foundation of the American colonies. Some believe this may account for the geographic location of the five great Revolutionary War cities. In particular, Boston, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. have all been built in perfect alignment along the eastern seaboard. Researcher Jim Allison believes this alignment may be a part of something greater. Let me say this, I think it is very unlikely that the alignment is coincidental. According to Allison, the alignment of cities and ancient sites are part of a series of great circles that encompass the Earth. These circles are supposedly like lines of power upon which significant sites are built. The simplest example, the most obvious example of a great circle, though, is the equator because it runs around the center of the Earth, it runs due east-west. Meridians of longitude, which run due north-south through the north and south poles, if you extend it all the way around, those are also great circles because they run through the center of the Earth. Allison claims that mystical sites like the pyramids, Easter Island, the Mayan and Aztec cities are all built upon these great circles. In addition, one of these great circles contains the five cities that date back to the era of the American Revolutionary War. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York City, and Boston are, in fact, aligned. They're fairly close together. The distance from Washington, D.C. to Boston is 400 miles. And as a result of that, you can, you can see the alignment uh, just on a flat map because the, the curvature of the Earth is not so much over that distance um, to, to distort it. But on a, on a three-dimensional map, it's, it's even clearer. But is this just a curious coincidence? Or could there be some hidden meaning behind it? 
In the 1920s, an Englishman named Alfred Watkins noted a series of straight tracks or lines upon the Earth's surface that seemed to connect the ancient monuments and holy sites around the world. What he found was that in a number of cases, a number of these monuments were aligned in just in dead straight lines that extended from a few miles to, in some cases, many miles. He coined the term ley lines to describe and to explain these alignments. Um, Watkins believed that there are some type of grid lines that run through the Earth, of lines of energy or magnetism or electromagnetism or some other kind of attraction over the Earth. And that's what that's what he described as ley lines. Um, Watkins believed that the builders of these sites were aware of these lines that ran through the earth and that they intentionally built these monuments on these lines. While Watkins' findings were not openly received by all, his views have been most often embraced by members of the esoteric community. And in the occult, there's this concept of ley lines, L-E-Y, uh, which are lines of force that are that some people say are like the acupuncture points of the earth. And you always want to build things on a ley line. All of the great cathedrals of Europe are built upon these ley lines, which are like currents of power. These currents of power are thought to have magical significance. Some believe they act as portals for spirits to travel to and from the ancient monuments that fall within these alignments. But the question remains, were such power lines important to the builders of early American cities? Were they aligned with a secret purpose in mind? It's very important where the, the pyramid of Khufu is built, the Great Pyramid. And it's very important where Stonehenge is built. There are several great circles that ancient monuments are aligned with. And in some cases, ancient and modern development is aligned with. Extending the alignment from Boston to the northeast uh, towards Europe, the alignment crosses over the Atlantic and crosses into England and crosses over Stonehenge, which of course is one of the more significant monuments certainly in England and, and arguably anywhere. Can it be coincidental that the early colonists built these five cities in perfect alignment with each other and in perfect alignment with Stonehenge? Allison admits that many of the ancient monuments are aligned on ley lines or great circles within a fraction of one degree, a distance that sometimes equals 15 or 20 miles. But in the link between the old world and the new, there is a zero deviation between the five American cities and England's mysterious Stonehenge. According to Allison, they are perfectly aligned. Can such a perfect alignment be unintentional or the result of some natural attraction of ley lines in the earth? There's some dispute about that amongst people who, who study these ley lines as to whether um, the builders were aware of an attraction and they built it for that reason or whether there was possibly an attraction that they were unaware of but nonetheless caused them to build these sites in alignment. But the the simple fact is they are aligned. But the evidence continues. America's capital city, Washington, D.C., is said to be positioned on the 77th Meridian West, considered a sacred location referred to as God's Longitude. In his book, Marking Time, author Duncan Steele argues that the early expedition of Sir Walter Raleigh, known for the lost colony at Roanoke, was not quite the failure it seemed to be. Raleigh's intent, according to Steele, was not really to establish a colony, but rather to capture God's longitude by locating the 77th meridian. The, the goal of the occultist who understands these concepts is to have things exist within the sacred harmonies of the earth. 
And if indeed they believed that the 77th meridian was somehow very sacred, then it would be incredibly important for them to, to plant their flag there. In Washington, D.C. is even found Meridian Hill, said to mark the precise location of the sacred longitude. Raleigh himself was a member of Bacon's secret society in England. Was he sent on a mystical journey so that America might be designed according to esoteric principles from the beginning? And how many others came ashore as a result of the Baconian influence? The Rosicrucians came ashore very early on in the founding of the New World. Uh, the Masons were also there from the beginning. And uh, I think from very early on, this, this if you will, um, cartel, this occult cartel of various groups, basically had it as their goal to establish a society on this continent that was wholly given over to esoteric goals. <laughs> The Rosicrucian Order, with its modern headquarters in San Jose, California, has for centuries been linked to Freemasonry. Well, you have to understand that Freemasonry is simply the modern-day manifestation of the ancient mystery of religions. The ideas of Masonry were, have been around literally for thousands of years. And of course, Rosicrucianism uh, was simply a, a forerunner of modern-day Masonry. The Order takes its name from its primary symbol, the rose and cross. Like masonry, the Rosicrucians trace their religion to the mysteries of ancient Egypt. Their power base in San Jose centers around an Egyptian museum. There are chapters of the Rosicrucians studying every place across America, and one only has to go up on the internet, and you, they actually have websites where they recruit people into the Rosicrucian order. People have no idea that uh, these people are even here. Perhaps the reason for their lack of exposure is that they are dwarfed by the chief of all secret societies, the ancient order of Freemasonry. Nevertheless, the Rosicrucians are said to be the first of the secret orders to have opened a door in the New World. The very first that we know of a cult beachhead in America was Rosicrucian. I just, I was out on a speaking tour recently and I had the opportunity to visit the Ephrata Cloister, it's called, in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And it's where the original Rosicrucian community built its, its headquarters, uh, right, right on the east coast of the United States. And that was in the 1600s. And right about the same time that Christianity was establishing its beachhead in America, so was the Rosicrucian order. In the 16th century, Sir Francis Bacon had become the chief of the Rosicrucians in England. Researchers believe that Bacon sent members of this society to America to launch his esoteric empire, the New Atlantis. This 1910 Newfoundland stamp commemorates Bacon's early influence. It reads, Lord Bacon, the guiding spirit in the colonization scheme. I know that Rosicrucianism today holds Bacon in highest esteem as an active transmitter of the secrets. Uh, if you go to the AMORC, the Ancient Mystical Order of the Rose and the Cross, the Rosicrucian Order Center in San Jose, Bacon is everywhere. Uh, he is, he's a, a demigod uh, in, in, in Rosicrucianism. But Bacon's influence was not confined to Rosicrucianism. He is considered by some to have been the first to formalize the mystery teachings into a system now recognized as modern Masonry. So Freemasonry up to that point had been very, very much involved with just the craft of building buildings. Um, it had been a guild in this country and each country had their own type of Masonry or Freemasonry. There was no sense for it being a worldwide fraternity where religious belief or race did not matter. 
before that had been very racial and very relig religious, but Bacon turned it into a, a truly international society. This international society would also come to the New World. And while Bacon's Rosicrucians would maintain a position of careful anonymity, the Order of Masonry would stretch its hands in America to the very heights of power. Nowhere is the Masonic presence more clearly seen than in the design of America's capital city, Washington, D.C. Yes, Washington, D.C. is completely uh, uh, based on, uh, on Masonic architecture. The whole architecture is laid out in an occult manner with Masonic symbology. Every major building in, the, in Washington, D.C. has a Masonic plaque on it. I mean, the, the Masons have permeated and the other secret societies have permeated our society since the very beginning. In his book, The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, Author David Ovison confirms the esoteric influence of masonry in the design and building of Washington, D.C. Ovison reveals the occult ceremonies surrounding the laying of the city's cornerstone, a ritual that involved the father of the nation, George Washington. 200 years later, in a ceremony commemorating this event, Senator Strom Thurmond, himself a 33rd degree Mason, is pictured alongside the cornerstone upon which is carved a Masonic square and compass. If you either look at the map of Washington, D.C. or try and drive in Washington, D.C., you think it must have been designed by a nutcase, but actually it was designed by a Freemason, a French Freemason named L'Enfant. Uh, I think Pierre Charles L'Enfant was his name, and, and it's full of esoteric symbolism. Ovison writes that, like the pyramids of Egypt, the entire city was built in alignment with the stars, and suggests that the hidden purpose for the Masonic rituals is that America might be empowered by the gods of the ancient world. Can this be the reason for the pagan god and goddess images that have come to represent America. Tradition often claims that America was founded as a Christian nation only. But if this is the case, why are its symbols those of the pagan religions rather than images of Christ, the apostles, and stories from the Bible? Well, I think that this is where the great confusion comes in. Uh, America was founded as a Christian nation, but it was also founded as an occult nation. And there have always been two parallel forces here in America. One the Christian, one the occult, dating back into the 1600s. And until you understand that, you can't understand anything going on in the world today. The conflict between Christianity and the occult has compelled some to reject entirely the influence of God in early America. In February of 2005, cbsnews.com posted an article titled Our Godless Constitution. In it, author Brooke Allen wrote that our nation was not founded on Christian principles, but on enlightenment ones. God only entered the picture as a very minor player and Jesus Christ was conspicuously absent. A chief issue of debate are the very symbols that define the United States. Where do they come from and what or who exactly do they represent? For many, the answers lie in the secret societies. I mean, you can see their influence uh, on the back of the Great Seal of the United States. Where in 1782, uh, they put on a pyramid cap by an all-seeing eye with the slogan beneath, Novus Adoro Seclorum, the new secular order of the world. That was in 1782. It was put on the back of the Great Seal of the United States, hidden there until 
uh, about 1935 when it was taken off the back of the Great Seal of the United States and put on the back of the American dollar bill. Where it is today, symbolizing the influence of the secret societies on America. And you know, there are some of our Christian ministries that want to tell you that a cult symbol is a Christian symbol. It just goes to show how effectively the Christians have been misled. And they've been misled intentionally by people who've infiltrated the Christian movement and have told them, oh, this is a Christian symbol. Well, where in Christian symbology uh, do you come up with a pyramid? Where in Christian symbology do you come up with a glorified eye This is all the symbology that everybody who's involved with the occult understands. The glorified or all-seeing eye is known as the Eye of Horus, one of the most important gods of the Egyptian mysteries. Other pagan icons include the Washington Monument, an obelisk normally dedicated to the Egyptian sun god. Meanwhile, the idea for the Statue of Liberty was taken from the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and combined with the imagery of the goddess of ancient Babylon, Queen Semiramis. But what do these esoteric elements tell us about the founding fathers of America? Who were they? And what was the light by which they saw the world and themselves in it? The majority of the people who were in the founding fathers were either deists or else they were free thinkers or they were Rosicrucians or they were Masons or they were all of the above. But the issue is not black and white. Researchers are careful to point out the God-fearing nature of early Americans. If we take the founding of America as the time when the Puritans came over, if that's the time that was taken and the landing of the pilgrims, you remember, and, and that, that date there, if that was taken as the founding of America, there was no question. These are solid Christians out and they were looking for freedom. They did not want to be persecuted by either the um, the church in England, which was the Anglican Church, so the Puritans would have been persecuted as dissenters. Nevertheless, so if we take that date, that era, when the Puritans came over, they were coming over seeking um, freedom, religious freedom, and so they wanted to settle the land and build their little churches and worship the Lord as he told us to do, and in the manner in which he told us to do in the scriptures. That's what they wanted to do, so without question, it was settled in the beginning as a Christian nation, an opportunity to come over freely. Unfortunately, you've got other people who wanted to do the same thing, but they weren't necessarily Christians. By far, the chief source of contention is the involvement of the Founding Fathers with secret societies, namely Freemasonry. Certainly at the time when the Declaration of Independence was signed, many of these people were involved in masonry, no question at all about it. But it wasn't because they were dedicated to the, to the esoteric principles of masonry. Many of these people were strong Christians. In America, initially, the men that were elected, I believe uh, 90 percent of them were all God-fearing men. People, you know, on the esoteric side is, want to say, oh, this was a Masonic country. And there's an element of truth in that because uh, certainly there were many Masons, you know, uh, once America was established, who were working in key positions. I believe the truth is somewhere in between, as it usually is, the two extremes. It's a timeless struggle. Both sides of this power struggle are in full play. The sides of the secret societies trying to push forth the new Atlantis. And so it doesn't surprise me that most of these men and the uh, in the uh, Continental Congress or the signings of the Declaration of Independence were, were Masons or whatever. That doesn't surprise me, it doesn't even bother me. Because I know that underneath them is a vast horde of people that were Biblical Christians. Masonry's history with America is filled with both mystery and controversy. Because of its secrecy, and because its members are bound by terrible blood oaths, Masons are reluctant to come forward with testimony. It's a secret society. It has always been a secret society. And to reveal anything about these secret societies ensures your death. And people who've tried to expose Masonry, even to this very day, risk their lives in doing it. Yet from the shadows, some light appears. 
when you actually go into masonry in the first three degrees, why you promise that if you are ever reveal any of the secrets of masonry in the first degree, of why you'll have your tongue uh, uh, cut out and you'll have your uh, you'll be buried in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck uh, at the level of low tide, and at the second degree, I believe they cut out your heart, uh, and the third degree they're going to cut out your entrails and burn them. In the 19th century, a man named Captain William Morgan was murdered by a group of Masons who were bound by such blood oaths. Well, Captain William Morgan was a uh, guy up in Batavia, New York in 1826. He uh, was the first American to publish the first three degrees of uh, Freemasonry of the Blue Lodge. The things you had to say, the oaths you had to take. And uh, Masons didn't like that very much. Captain Morgan had vi violated his oath by writing a book to let people know about the terrible oaths of this terrible society. Feeling a responsibility to the Masonic Brotherhood, three members of the order kidnapped Morgan to make him pay for exposing the secrets of Masonry. Hey, what is this? What is this? He was captured by a group of Masons and taken uh, uh, and killed. And uh, later on, the perpetrators uh, made deathbed confessions of it all, so it was all very well known. Of these deathbed confessions, at least one has survived, given by a man named Henry L. Valance, whose insight into Morgan's final moments provides a heart-wrenching account. While Valance was never brought to justice for the crime, his final confession revealed a conscience haunted by a lifetime of guilt. If the mark of Cain wasn't upon me, the curse of the first murderer was. The blood stain was upon my hands and could not be washed out. Valance revealed how a council of eight Masons had condemned William Morgan to death. Council, no, no, no. made a decision and decided your fate. Are you ready to pay for your betrayal? Talk to me, man. I've done what was right. And how Morgan had pleaded for his life on behalf of his wife and children. He commenced wringing his hands and talking of his wife and children, the recollections of whom in that awful hour terribly affected him. Please, my children, my wife. His wife, he had said, was young and inexperienced, and his children were but infants. You should have thought about that before you turned us in, before you wrote the book. May God have mercy on your children, because we will not have mercy on you. Despite Morgan's plea for mercy, Valance and his fellow Masons were determined to carry out their grim task. They gave Morgan time alone to prepare himself to die. How Morgan passed that time, said Valance, he could not tell, for everything was quiet as a tomb within. When they returned, they bound his hands and led him away to the awful fate they had prepared for him. story was he was actually drowned uh, after being mistreated horribly for a period of time. Well, when the word of this got out and people began to realize this dangerous influence of masonry within high society, why the membership of the organization fell off dramatically. As one uh, investigator put it, as one writer put it, uh, Freemasonry, free which was rampant throughout the country at that time, almost dried up overnight. The public outrage over Morgan's death was profound, but when those who had murdered him were sought out, the people of the United States discovered that justice was not so easy to obtain. The reason was given by the Reverend Charles Finney in his book, The Character Claims and Practical Workings of Freemasonry, first published in 1869. Finney was a former Mason who lived through the Morgan Affair. 
He claimed that justice in the case was impossible because nearly all of the civil offices in the country were in the hands of Freemasons. According to Finney, even the newspapers of the day were completely under their control. Finney writes that it was found that they could do nothing with the courts, with the sheriffs, with the eyewitnesses, or with the jurors, and all their efforts were for a time entirely impotent. So this turned into a big brouhaha. It was a big Masonic scandal because it was all known. The Morgan incident became an issue of national importance, not simply because a man was murdered, but more importantly, Americans began to realize that their supposedly democratic country was being secretly controlled by the Masonic Brotherhood. And this led even to uh, uh, separate political parties, being anti-Masonic political parties being formed. And they were even called the Anti-Masonic Party. They were in candidates for president. And they were significant parties. They weren't just minority parties. So it was a really big deal. The Anti-Masonic Party was the first third party in American politics and eventually became the Whig Party, which is more widely recognized. The party itself was led by former president John Quincy Adams, who wrote a collection of letters and essays against Freemasonry. How can you have a free society when you have people who belong to these secret societies and have sworn these terrible blood oaths? You can't have a free society. And that's what John Quincy Adams was writing about. Adams wrote, I do conscientiously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils. As a result of the Morgan incident, a series of official investigations took place. In 1829, a New York State Senate committee published its findings on Masonry, stating that its members were found in almost every place where power is of any importance. Five years later, in 1834, a joint committee in Massachusetts reported that Masonry was, quote, a distinct independent government within our own government and beyond the control of the laws of the land by means of its secrecy. Well, the influence of Masonry uh, has always been here since those days. And of course, within 15 or 20 years, why uh, the the membership of Masonry had reconstituted itself. It said they, they got down to only about 5,000 members there when Masonry was really exposed. But people soon forgot about uh, the, uh, the terrible things that had happened. And the fact that if you were a Mason, they really would kill you. Most people look upon Masonry as simply a oh, fraternity, and these oaths have no meaning. But tragically, they do. A monument was erected in Batavia, New York, and remains to this day in remembrance of what happened to William Morgan. The inscription on its base reads, To the memory of William Morgan, a native of Virginia, a captain in the War of 1812, a respectable citizen of Batavia, and a martyr to the freedom of writing, printing, and speaking the truth. He was abducted from near this spot in the year 1826 by Freemasons and murdered for revealing the secrets of their order. The monument goes on to tell the reader where they can find the historical records that document the Morgan account. Why would the citizens of Batavia have gone to this length? Crimes are committed every day and people sometimes murdered. Why draw attention to William Morgan? Did they desire to warn future generations? Was it because the people of that time recognized, as Charles Finney asserts in his book, that America was being controlled by Masons from behind the scenes? But for what cause? For greed, power? Or is the answer most likely found in the great Atlantean plan? In order to bring forth the destiny of America and lead mankind into the vision of Plato, and Sir Francis Bacon, the secret societies would have to control the new world and in time subdue the old.
but how to bring about this utopian empire. In his writings, Sir Francis Bacon called for a universal reformation of the whole wide world. To bring about this reform, some believe the secret societies launched a world revolution. People do not understand that our revolution was the first in a series of revolutions uh, that began in 1776 and extended right up until uh, the Cuban Revolution in 1959 when Fidel Castro came to power. And this is a series of revolutions to transform the world. While most Americans did not fight the War of Independence for the cause of global revolution, it is undeniable that secret societies played an important role and that many of America's founders were Freemasons. Many of them were Masons, but they were in, in, into Masonry uh, because, of course, this was the only way that they could protect themselves. This was the only way they could keep from being found out. So the, they were plotting a revolution. They had to have a means of maintaining their secrecy. I think Masonry was, in fact, used as a built-in network, a secret network, in which to foment the American Revolution. They didn't have to put a network together. It was already there. All I had to do was, cause was sort of ride on the back of Freemasonry to make the American Revolution work. And work it did with the help of Masonic ingenuity, beginning with the kickoff event, the Boston Tea Party. And what was the Boston Tea Party? Who was behind that? What was, who were the raiders of the, the English tea ship? Admittedly, at this point, it was the Masonic Lodge in Boston. They were all Masons. It was the Masons wanting to implement this revolution. The leader of the men who dressed up like Indians and threw the tea into Boston Harbor was the legendary Paul Revere, whose famous ride would alert Americans that the British were coming. Pictured here with a teapot commemorating his rebellion, Paul Revere was a prominent member of the Masonic Order. George Washington, known as the father of our country, along with many of his generals, were also Masons. Yet Washington's involvement with Masonry is hotly debated. Our information is, is that he did not do anything with the Masonic Lodge for the last 30 years of his life. The debate centers around a letter written by George Washington to the Reverend G.W. Schneider on September 25, 1798 just 15 months before Washington's death. In the letter, Washington says specifically, I must correct an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. The fact is, I preside over none, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. And in Washington's case, I defend him by saying, the Masons are very secretive. When they approach a man, to be a member of their organization, they will not and cannot tell him what it's all about. But what they can do and do is to say, well, you see, there were all these famous people. They were Freemasons and they can name off the kings. And today, of course, they can name off Washington. And so the candidate would then argue to himself, well, who am I? <laughs> I'm just a little guy, you know, or I might be a senator, but nevertheless, who am I? Compared with these, if it was good enough for them, surely it's good enough for me. If it's secret, it's gonna be a good thing. So they get in and they're not told the whole story. They're not told in the first, second, or even third degree. They're not told the whole story, but little by little, as they acquire more knowledge and as they are deemed to be uh, faithful to the cause, they are told more. And that's just how they get the people in. It is only fair to mention that many Masons continue to insist that Washington was very active in the craft. Yet there is no debate about the Masonic membership of Benjamin Franklin, who is deeply involved not only with Masonry, but a whole variety of secret societies in America, in England, and in France. Societies that had everything to do with his success during the American Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin is a very paradoxical, complex fellow, as might be expected for someone who is such a great genius. But um, at times he seems like he's a Christian. At times he seems like he's a scoundrel. 
At times it seems like he's a Luciferian, and at times it seems like he's a Rosicrucian. He was a, a strange character, Benjamin Franklin, a sort of a shuttle diplomat between Philadelphia and Paris and London, England. He was, of course, an ambassador in Europe, and when he was over in Europe, he became a member of a group called the Hellfire Club, which was a kind of pseudo-satanic organization in 17, 1700s. It was founded by an English nobleman named Francis Dashwood, and it basically existed as a place where men could gather and have orgies and worship the devil and basically get loaded and do whatever they wanted. <laughs> Under the guise of it being a satanic society. The Hellfire Club was a part of the so-called gentlemen's clubs of 17th and 18th century England. While the debauched behavior of these groups was initially tolerated, once they began to dabble in satanic rituals, they were forced to go underground, literally. Hellfire Club, as a matter of fact, I used to live quite near that place. It's, um, it's on the west side of London at a place called West Wickham. It's a, hull, a hill. It's a chalk hill now, of course, covered in grass. And on the top of that chalk hill is a church. On the top of the church is a golden ball. There's a cross on top of that. Now, that's a Christian church, but inside the hill is a cave. Often those chalk hills, they do have caves inside them. It's the way they're formed. And uh, in the cave there, they would uh, gather together. Now, I don't say that it was the church, the occupants of the church that gathered there, but whether they knew it or not, the Hellfire Club would hold their, hold their meetings once a month underneath the church. And Benjamin Franklin uh, would go and visit that uh, at the times when he came to visit England, yeah. It was very much apparently into um, some of the ideas of the esoteric movement of his day. A book on witchcraft, magic, and the supernatural claims that Benjamin Franklin often came to Sir Francis Dashwood for information on the occult. Dashwood himself was said to be a Rosicrucian and leading member of the secret orders. In this portrait, we see a young Francis Dashwood with his hand posed in a fist-like position. In masonry, this hand signal is known as the lion's paw and is used in Masonic ritual. Among Satanists, however, the same gesture is said to be called the Devil's Claw. While it cannot be said how deeply involved Franklin was with the occult, the hellfire focus on drinking and debauching women would certainly have agreed with his character. He was very famous for being a ladies' man. Uh, you know, he was very much a playboy which of course would be contrary to being a, a, a devout Christian. The Hellfire Club had great disdain for Christianity. In fact, they did not call themselves Hellfire, but rather the monks of Medmenham Abbey. Such parody was the influence of a French priest named Francois Rabelais, condemned as a heretic for writing a series of perverse comedies called Gargantua and Pantagruel. In them, Rabelais mocked religion, glorified immorality and defended man's right to pursue without restraint the desires of his own will. Adopting his philosophy, the Hellfire motto was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Could this have been what attracted Franklin to the group, an opportunity to escape the puritanical tendencies of America? while in England to pursue lusty desires that would have been openly condemned by his fellow countrymen, at least at that time. But more than a century later, the Hellfire motto would be adopted by British occultist Aleister Crowley, who was often called the wickedest man in the world. Like Francis Dashwood and the Hellfire members, Crowley took part in satanic rituals most famously at his Abbey Thelema in Sicily, a name taken from Francois Rabelais' anti-Christian parodies. Crowley's hatred for Christianity was so intense, he often referred to himself as the Beast of the Apocalypse from the Book of Revelation. He was a Freemason and a Rosicrucian who made Do What Thou Wilt famous through the 20th century, 
with followers like L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, Harvard professor and drug guru Timothy Leary, and even Beatles founder John Lennon. Crowley is often credited with sparking the 1960s cultural revolution, the do-your-own-thing mentality dedicated to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What could be called the modern legacy of men like Franklin, Dashwood, and the Hellfire Club. But wait a minute. Obviously, it cannot be said that Franklin's involvement with the Hellfire Club is to be fully equated with the often crazed activities of a man like Crowley or even Timothy Leary. Still, one must wonder what Franklin was doing with a group of immoral aristocrats who dabbled in devil worship, even if they were just kidding around as some have suggested. Is it likely that this legendary founder of America, the man who discovered electricity, invented the bifocals, and co-authored the Declaration of Independence, simply spent his time in England getting drunk and seducing women? Franklin was known to be a crafty fellow. Could his dealings with Dashwood and the Hellfire Club have somehow been a part of a greater agenda? After all, Sir Francis Dashwood was no ordinary drunken rake. He also happened to be a member of the British Parliament and was a close friend and advisor to King George III, the man the American colonists would rebel against. The Hellfire Club itself were made up of English nobility, some of whom held high offices in the King's government. Was it mere coincidence that these men, close friends of Franklin, just happened to be in power when the British were defeated? In his book, The Occult Conspiracy, author Michael Howard chronicles how Benjamin Franklin came to England in 1758 to discuss the future of the American colonies with Sir Francis Dashwood. Meanwhile, British historian Richard Deacon, in his History of the British Secret Service, claims that Dashwood's Hellfire Club functioned as a center of English espionage. Because of Franklin's many clandestine activities, some involving a British double agent named Edward Bancroft, Deacon and fellow historian Professor Cecil B. Curry speculate that Ben Franklin may have been a covert spy for the British government, known either as Number 72 or with the code name Moses. But was Franklin working for the British? Or were secret powers within the King's own government working with Franklin for the ancient plan of all secret societies, the New Atlantis. Why would British intelligence refer to Benjamin Franklin as Moses? Normally, enemies are given names like Carlos the Jackal or the Butcher of Baghdad. But Moses? Was the name itself a kind of cipher or secret code? Had they already determined that as Moses led the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, so Franklin would lead the American colonies to freedom from King George. Could this be why Benjamin Franklin's initial design for the Great Seal of the United States was that of Moses standing on the shoreline of the Red Sea as the waters destroyed Pharaoh and his army, with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. Coincidence? Maybe. Yet in his book, America's Secret Destiny, author Robert Hieronymus, whose doctrinal thesis on the reverse of the Great Seal has been used by the White House, the State Department, and the Department of the Interior, makes the comment that Franklin's design for the seal represented, quote, how he viewed America's birth and destiny. Did Franklin really see himself as Moses? defeating King George, the colonial pharaoh, with the help of Dashwood and the Hellfire Club. An alarming theory. But for British intelligence to undermine King George on behalf of a secret agenda should not be terribly surprising. 
at least not to the modern American. Consider the conflict between President John F. Kennedy and the CIA during the Bay of Pigs invasion. The CIA reportedly lied to the president on behalf of their secret agenda involving an assassination attempt on Fidel Castro, something that would later lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. JFK was so surprised at their power, believing it to be a threat to the American people, he vowed to shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. Or what about the Iran-Contra affair, where President Ronald Reagan stated emphatically that the U.S. was not providing arms to Iran in exchange for hostages being held by pro-Iranian terror groups. In spite of the wildly speculative and false stories about arms for hostages and alleged ransom payments, we did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. But Reagan soon returned with an apology once he learned that, yes, the U.S. was illegally selling arms to Iran, an enemy country. The profits from the sales were then being used to finance a secret CIA operation involving the Contras in Nicaragua. As with JFK, Reagan claimed that he had been manipulated and lied to by secret powers within the intelligence community. It's going on that had been kept from me in various covert Mr. operations. President, did they deceive you? We didn't answer with a pointer, a point dexter in North deceived you. Presidents Reagan and Kennedy were humiliated at being the most powerful men in the world who were unaware of what the hidden powers in their own government were up to. Well, at least in the case of Kennedy. It was later revealed that President Reagan knew more about the covert actions of the intelligence community than he had let on. After all, his vice president, George Bush Sr., was the former head of the CIA and a member of an elite secret society known as the Skull and Bones. Some find it interesting that while in office, President Reagan was made an honorary 33rd degree Mason. Since then, America's presidents have all been members of secret orders, including Skull and Bonesman George W. Bush, whose war on terror is said by some to have sparked the beginnings of World War III. Bush claimed it was the CIA who provided the information about weapons of mass destruction that ultimately led to the war in Iraq. As of the making of this documentary, that information has turned out to be false. An intelligence error? Maybe. Or perhaps the same powers that were working in the days of Benjamin Franklin have never really ceased to function. Is it just a coincidence that the war on terror has provided the opportunity to spread democracy to all the world? And this is what people don't understand, is, as our president talks about how we want to bring democracy to all these countries of the world. Well, why doesn't he want to bring a republic to these countries? We were a republic. We were never a democracy. It is only the people from the mystery religions and the secret societies who are pushing this idea of world democracy or this combination of enlightened nations, enlightened democracies to rule the world. As incredible as it may seem, there are really people who believe that. They're working full time to accomplish that goal. And until you understand that they are the primary force behind the wars of this last century and World War III, which we are entering into today, unless they understand that the whole idea is uh, to create this reestablishment of what they believe is lost Atlantis, this wonderful utopian society that they believe existed uh, eons ago. Anybody who studied the history of America knows we were not established as a democracy. Our founding fathers didn't believe in democracy. They wanted a republic, a government of law, not uh, the de democracy, which is what the secret societies have been working for for well over 3,000 years. Could this be the secret behind what's happening in the world today? And was this the underlying motive in the war for American independence? To wrestle the new world from the power of the old, that it might in time be used to bring forth the great Atlantean plan envisioned by Sir Francis Bacon. 
Benjamin Franklin certainly knew the works of Francis Bacon and all the ethics and things that he was uh, trying to establish. Bacon was a man that Benjamin Franklin had much in common with. Both men were the leading scientists of their time. Both men were involved in printing and both men published works that helped to transform the people of their generation. Both men developed their own system of ciphers and secret codes, which they used for intelligence purposes during wartime. And both men were deeply involved in the Masonic and Rosicrucian movements of their day. Franklin was a member of Masonic and secret orders in America, in England, and in France, the three countries involved in the American Revolution. But some researchers argue that his influence in France truly demonstrates his loyalty to a plan that looked beyond America, to a global revolution. He was the master of the uh, uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters, Nilchois, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters right in Paris, and that's where the revolution started, incidentally. So he was lodge master there every time he visited the place. He, as so many young people, very intelligent people, really believed that man could create a better society without being totally reliant upon God. And of course, we know that he eventually he went to France, and he was when he was in France as the American ambassador to France, uh, he was instrumental in pushing these ideas that led to the French Revolution. Franklin went to France to convince King Louis the Sixteenth to finance the American Revolution. But in the process, Franklin was preaching radical ideas that would later on inspire the French to overthrow Louis, the very monarch who had helped to pay for the founding of America. Americans desperately needed money to fight the War of Independence because, according to Franklin, England had ruined their economy to keep America from becoming too prosperous. When he was ambassador to England, um, the Bank of England said, how come America, the, the representatives of the Bank of England said, how come America is getting so rich? And Franklin, in his autobiography, recounts the story. He said, well, that's easy. In America, we create our own money and we owe no interest to pay to no one. Uh, so the Bank of England said, oh, that's very interesting. So they immediately had passed through Parliament the Currency Act of 1764. And what did the Currency Act do? It outlawed uh, the creation of America's own money and made, um, put America on the gold standard, made Americans pay their taxes in gold or silver coin, which of course was very scarce in the American colonies in those days. So what was the result? It, it immediately plunged America into a deep depression. Franklin says that this, this depression, and uh, uh, everyone in America was well aware of what the depression, who caused the depression, why it was caused, just because England outlawed America just simply printing its own money, and that it was this uh, Currency Act of 1764 that was really the root cause of the American Revolution, because it caused uh, so much unemployment and uh, uh, a terrible ec economic upheaval. And Franklin's quote is, we could have endured a little tax on tea and other matters, but it was England's taking away our ability to create our own currency that was really the root cause of the revolution. And so King Louis supported the American cause through financial aid and the use of troops. But some years later, many of the French soldiers who fought for America would return to France to fight the French Revolution. Among their leaders would be an American hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, who served alongside George Washington. Lafayette was also a Freemason and close acquaintance of Benjamin Franklin, the man who seemed to be the friend of nearly all the revolutionaries of the day. It was Benjamin Franklin who initiated Voltaire himself uh, in 1778. He could then brag and say, oh, Voltaire was a Mason. Ooh. People would say, if it's good enough for him, it must be good enough for me. I don't know what it's all about, but it sounds like a good thing. While the writings of Voltaire inspired the French revolutionaries, Americans were compelled by another of Franklin's close friends, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a member of the Lunar Society. Benjamin okay. Franklin would go and meet with them, yeah. Anyway, he recognized in Thomas Paine that the fellow was, um, he was pretty good at writing. And so he brought him back with him 
to Philadelphia and he wrote the pamphlets, the pamphlets that started the revolution in America. It was a little booklet called Common Sense. Thomas Paine wrote that and it was kind of um, inciting people to war against King George III. With the help of Paine and his fellow Masons, Franklin worked to create the revolutionary mentality among the colonies. Yes, Franklin developed the concept of the virtuous revolution. The thought of revolting against a monarch uh, amongst European people was absolutely anathema. It went totally against the European mindset of the divine right of kings, where uh, government is of God, kings are appointed by God, and so the virtuous revolution was something really different. But not all Masons went along with Franklin's ideas, like the man known as the great American trader, Benedict Arnold, also a Mason who chose to side with the British during the war. Nevertheless, for good or for ill, Masonry was clearly at the helm of the War of Independence. It seems ironic, however, that American Masonry today owes its allegiance to the very country it rebelled against. Modern Masons trace their official beginning to the United Grand Lodge of England, founded in 1717. The official start of modern masonry is in 1717 in the Apple Tree Tavern in London, where the first Grand Lodge of England was convened. And that's called the Mother Lodge, because essentially all English-speaking lodges precipitate out of that. And for example, all American lodges, all the different Grand Lodges of the different states, all ultimately owe their allegiance and their warrant to the Grand Lodge of England. Yet prior to the formation of the Grand Lodge, the seeds of modern masonry had already been sown through the work of Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon established the Masonic organization, that, that whole body that was established by Francis Bacon. The uh, ethical programs that were inherent within that, he was responsible for all those. His philosophy, his ethics, his literature that he was responsible for would certainly be known to Benjamin Franklin. Was Franklin following Bacon's plan? Was it mere coincidence that he was a chief catalyst in the launching of the American Revolution? Or that his influence would also bring about the revolution in France? Masonic philosopher Manley P. Hall wrote that not only were many American founders Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose, known only to the initiated few. Hall further suggests that Benjamin Franklin was among those few. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Hall writes of Franklin's involvement with the plan of Francis Bacon. In chapter 13, titled Bacon's Secret Society Set Up in America, Hall features an illustration showing the eastern seaboard with Benjamin Franklin overseeing it, while beside him is the shadow of Bacon. Hall claims that Franklin spoke for the secret societies and that most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Revolution were also members. He says, quote, the plan was working out. The new Atlantis was coming into being in accordance with the program laid down by Francis Bacon. To those who have studied him, Sir Francis Bacon is one of the most enigmatic figures in world history. Baconian societies have existed for centuries since his death in 1626. All of them credit Bacon with the great advancements of the New World. Bacon is such an interesting character, such a complex character. Uh, he was right at the center of the storm politically. Um, he even claimed in, in one of his writings that he was in possession of all knowledge. Uh, you can't even say, you can't say that he was ignorant of the Christian concept. He, he obviously had some concept of Christianity and speaks of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet he's a proponent of the New Atlantis concept. Just a very complicated uh, character. 
Bacon is known as the father of modern science and the grandfather of the English Enlightenment. The phrase, knowledge is power, is often attributed to him and represents his philosophy that through knowledge or science, mankind could transform himself and the world into its highest state of enlightenment. His dedication to science and learning led to the birth of England's premier scientific organization. When the Royal Society of England was formed in 1662, they named Bacon as their model and inspiration. There's a book written by Thomas Spratt, who was the first president of the Royal Society. So this goes back to the uh, early 1700s, and he wrote a history on it. And he acknowledged there that Francis Bacon was the originator of the idea. Yet even beyond the Royal Society, 20th century historian Will Durant wrote that the whole tenor and career of British thought have followed the philosophy of Bacon, a philosophy brought to America and furthered by some of her most influential leaders. Thomas Jefferson considered Francis Bacon one of the three most important men in history, along with John Locke and Sir Isaac Newton. It is even said that Jefferson believed he was fulfilling Bacon's dream for a new Atlantis by founding the United States. As a result, nearly all Baconians credit Bacon with the founding of America. This painting, once owned by Baconian author Marie Bauer Hall, shows the North American continent with the spirit of Bacon rising from the midst. Above his head is the all-seeing eye of Horace in the midst of a triangle, while upon his cloak is the rose and cross, the symbol of his Rosicrucians. Despite these things, little is mentioned about Lord Bacon in the history books of America. There are no states, cities, towns, or schools named after him, which begs the question, other than Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, which of the founding fathers did he really influence? Which of those founding fathers were most influenced by Bacon's work? I would suggest it was all those who were Freemasons. <laughs> well, I think probably all the uh, first presidents of America who were Freemasons, you could say, were influenced by him because of the influence that went into Freemasonry, but by, by Bacon. Um, but so, I expect some were more influenced than others, or more inspired than others, and some may not even have known that Bacon Bacon is considered by some to be the first grand master of modern Freemasonry. While the craft would not be officially established until after his death, it was Bacon who mapped out the plan for the ultimate aim of Masonry and all secret societies, the establishment of a new Atlantis. Peter Dawkins is the founder and president of the Francis Bacon Research Trust in England. He has dedicated more than 33 years to the study of Bacon, having written some 14 books about him, with titles such as Building Paradise and Francis Bacon, Herald of the New Age. My research into the life and work of Francis Bacon, all those connected with him, which also takes me back into the wisdom traditions, which I'm very interested in, and into also things like the founding of America, um, the spread of modern science, and many other fascinating subjects. <laughs> it's like a gateway, like a gateway into a huge um, wealth of information and knowledge for today. Dawkins' work is supported by the Pro Grand Master of English Masonry, the Marquis de Northampton. The Grand Master in England is Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent. Because he is a member of the royal family, Masonry allows Prince Edward to appoint someone to act in his place. As such, the Pro Grand Master, Lord Northampton, is the acting head of all British Freemasonry. While he declined to be interviewed for this documentary, in his correspondence with our producer, he made it clear that he supports Dawkins' research and considers him an expert on Sir Francis Bacon. This is significant because the Northampton legacy dates back to the time of Bacon and Queen Elizabeth I. 
Today, Lord Northampton holds authority over Canonbury Tower, where Francis Bacon lived in his lifetime and where he is said to have met with his secret societies. It's a fascinating building and quite a lot of it's still left. It was, was once a big mansion house um, and there's one wing of it left and also a tower which was at the end of another wing which has disappeared. And this tower is known as Canonbury Tower. And the whole mansion itself was, um, was enlarged and decorated by a man called Sir John Spencer in Queen Elizabeth's time. And he'd, he'd had a year as Lord Mayor. He was, was quite an important guy in the city of London and very, very wealthy, wealthy merchant. And he had a home in London itself. And he also had Canonbury Mansion as his country home, because then it was in the country. You know, now it's just surrounded by London, you know, part of London, but then it was in the country, up on a hill, and a wonderful place to go to, to get the country air and good for your health. And Sir John Spencer was clearly involved with Freemasonry and the early Rosicrucian group. And he embellished all the rooms of the house with special carvings on the oak panelling which have Masonic and Rosicrucian themes. And, uh, and particularly the fireplaces are done very, very carefully and specially. But the, the Compton and Spencer rooms uh, still have the original carved panelling in and the carved fireplaces, full of Masonic and Rosicrucian themes. That was done by Sir John Spencer, and the carvings are dated around about 1598 to 1601, that period. Well, eventually the house was taken over by um, Francis Bacon when he became Lord, when he's made Lord Keeper of the Great Seal and then Lord Chancellor and he rented the house for the rest of his life and it's during this time that um, what's called the Invisible College was founded and um, many other things were done and he's known to have carried out scientific experiments there and it's quite clear too that the house was the perfect meeting place for his Rosicrucian group. You know, it was, it was a headquarters outside London, it was private in those days. It could be well protected out of prying eyes. This labor of pursuing knowledge in secret represents Bacon's belief and method of working. In his New Atlantis, he wrote of a society that observed all things, but was known by no one. The symbolism of Bacon's home at Canonbury Tower with all its mystery, supports the mystical view of the man held by Dawkins himself. Well, it, using sort of Eastern terms, I'd say he, he was a master, but what, what in India they call a real master. But, but he was here in Europe, in, in, in the UK, uh, or in England at that time. And he was just an extraordinary being. I actually think that he was the one that Paracelsus made the prophecy about, called Elias the Artist referring to Elijah. And, and in tradition, Elijah is said to come again and again to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah or coming of the Christ, which has many different interpretations. Um, and Bacon himself called, called himself the Herald of the New Age, which is the title of Elijah. The question posed by critics of Baconian theology is, what Christ did Bacon come to herald? Was it the Christ of the Bible or the Christ of Masonry and the ancient mystery religion? In the ancient mysteries, a trinity is also recognized and is represented by a symbol that is little talked about, but one that some believe stands at the heart of all the Masonic tradition. It is known as the 47th proposition of Euclid or the Pythagorean theorem. Manley P. Hall illustrates and explains the occult symbolism of this theorem in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. A 
According to Hall, the right triangle represents this trinity. The perpendicular sign symbolizes the masculine or divine father, while the base represents the feminine or divine mother. Finally, the hypotenuse is looked upon as the offspring of them both, the divine child, who is sometimes called the Masonic Christ. Was this what Bacon came to herald? A Christ that delivers man through knowledge or science? According to Peter Dawkins, Bacon's desire was to deliver mankind from the fall he had suffered in the Garden of Eden, to restore him to paradise through what he called the six days work. So he always believed that as man was made in the image of God, as the Bible says, therefore we should imitate what God does. All his work imitates what he's learned from the Bible and from the interpretations of the Bible. And so the six days work of creation is how to create paradise, because that's in the Bible what's created as a result of the six days work. So he calls his, his great inspiration also the six days work, six days work of creation. And it's all planned out according to what he understood about what those six days or stages of creation can mean when interpreted into the human, human role, what human beings can do. While Bacon based his understanding on the Bible, Dawkins admits that his approach was not through traditional Christian doctrine, but rather a mystical view based in the teachings of Kabbalah. He worked like a Kabbalist. He was, um, he was a master of, of, of the Kabbalah, and particularly the Christian Kabbalah. The Kabbalah goes back through the Hebrews, through Moses, to ancient Egypt, and before that, it's said to Enoch, who was the great initiate and king of Atlantis. Um, and it said all the teachings come from Enoch, um, including this Kabbalah. And, and Bacon was a great master of Kabbalah. It, his whole work is based on Kabbalistic principles. While explaining Kabbalah could go on indefinitely, it might be generally called the Jewish version of the ancient mystery religion. In the modern world, Kabbalah has gained popularity among celebrities and is practiced by Barbra Streisand, Mick Jagger, Roseanne Barr, Britney Spears, Jeff Goldblum, Elizabeth Taylor, Paris Hilton, Demi Moore, Winona Ryder, and of course, Madonna, who has become a principal spokesman, much to the objection of some traditional Jews. In short, Kabbalah is designed to lead mankind to perfection, where man becomes a godlike being. It is a system that goes hand in hand with the concept of building paradise on earth. Sir Francis Bacon, the great Kabbalist, believed that the pursuit of science or knowledge was the way to achieve this great work. Most schoolboys used to know who Francis Bacon was and what he contributed to our knowledge today, and it was the method of science. Well, his first most public and, and fundamental effect he had was to um, form the basis of modern science, which is the experimental method. Um, so he promoted what Socrates had also promoted, which was to um, not just think in your mind and argue, you know, through arguments and so on, which is um, an Aristotelian method but actually go out and look what is there in reality, in, in nature, and study nature and derive your, your thoughts and ideas from that and base experiments on that to see if they work. Then if they work and if they're useful and they're proved useful over a length of time, then you might consider you've got perhaps a bit of truth and then you build on that. Well, up, up to Bacon's time, most of what one could call science, which was not really properly existing as such, except in the mystery schools, um, in all university, academia and so on, was just producing arguments after arguments. You see, up until Bacon's day, it was the church that was in control, and in fact the church was in control up until about the 1800s. So the church was in control, but the church hierarchy wasn't necessarily pure Christian. There was a lot of 
people that were there because they could handle three or four languages and they had great intellect, but were they Christians, real Christians? No, likely they were not. They knew their scripture, of course, but they were operating by the world system, and so the world system corrupted them. This corruption extended to their powers of discernment. While the Bible teaches that men should prove all things, many church academics in the Middle Ages trusted in an unsound method of deductive reasoning based upon a faulty understanding of the scriptures. And it, it typically it would go this way to give an example. They would say from the book of Acts where it says, and the gospel was preached to the whole world. That's one statement. Now the common statement that goes with that is, but the disciples and the apostles never went to the whole world. And therefore, you could deduce from those two statements that, well, there were no people on the other side of the world to preach to. You see? Well, obviously they were, because um, the explorers found there were people in Australia and Tasmania. <laughs> Years later, they found that. So there were other people on the other side of the world. So you see, they got the wrong deduction using that method of deduction. And that's what Francis Bacon pointed out. He said, there's so much nonsense. And so Bacon set out to establish a scientific method, one by which mankind might achieve all knowledge. Through this method, Bacon sought to bring forth a light that would eventually disclose and bring into sight all that is most hidden and secret in the universe. But first, he would have to find a way to overcome the stubborn traditions employed by the academics of his day who would rather debate than examine. Bacon gives a great example in exasperation when he was at university. He saw that there were professors and students spent three or four years debating how many teeth a horse has. Nobody went out to actually count them, you know. <laughs> they just wasted all that time <laughs> debating how many teeth a horse has. So he thought, saw, saw that as fruitless wasn't producing anything good or useful, and um, humanity just was not evolving, and there's so many people in poverty and sickness. So that's, he wanted to relieve that poverty and sickness and, um, and get us to, towards a future paradise, a world paradise, not just for, for the England, but for the world. So he, he really started the whole principles of modern science, which is this experimental method. And then he had, um, formula to you know to start with the basic basics the physical world which is physics physical laws and then work upwards towards metaphysics and so on he couldn't talk too openly when it got to metaphysics because it landed him in trouble with the religions of the time who were at war with each other so he he had to do that in a more careful way more veiled way but right about it he did Bacon's metaphysical ideas led him into teachings that would have been condemned by both the Catholic and Protestant churches of his day. He is said to have made contact with the spirit realm and that upon hearing a heavenly voice, he was given his life's work. To protect himself, he kept his practices veiled within secret societies. In particular, the ancient brotherhood of the Rose and Cross. The Rosicrucians had long believed that powers and principalities from the spirit realm possess secret knowledge that might be used for the benefit of mankind. These and other teachings were to be kept hidden from those considered profane and especially from the church. The Rosicrucians had to be a secret society. Their object was to go discover God's truths after him but some of their methodology was bordering on witchcraft. For instance, the transmutation of base metals into gold, they claimed they could do it. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, they, they claimed that they could communicate with angels and demons. Well, in the first place, the scripture tells you not to do it, but their idea was that if you could do that, surely those people, those, those creatures at least, the angels and the demons, they know a lot of things that we don't know. After all, they've been around since time immemorial, and they are familiar with heaven itself, so surely they can tell us many secrets. 
Well, the church, you see, would take a dim view of that, and they could be put to death for that sort of thing. The Rosicrucian Society had been formed in England prior to Bacon's birth, in part for the purpose of protecting Queen Elizabeth I. In the 16th century, the conflict between Roman Catholicism and the Protestant Church of England was at its peak. Mary Tudor, the daughter of King Henry VIII, took the throne and earned the title Bloody Mary. They were looking for another heir, and so there were no boy heirs of, um, or no legal boy heirs of Henry, but he had daughters, and uh, so we have Mary. And Mary was now 37, she was one of his daughters, and so she was installed as queen, and that was um, just after he died, so that would be in 58. And she was a Catholic, a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic, and she had actually married uh, Prince Philip II of Spain. Of course, he was a Catholic too. So the first thing that Mary did was to repeal those laws which permitted the Protestants to practice their religion. Repealed them and then forcefully put to death as many Christians that were of the Protestant faith as she could find. Within the uh, confines of the data that we have, she put to death 300, so there was 300 martyrs there that we know about in, this, in the short six-year reign that she had. No one was safe from Mary's wrath against the so-called Protestant heretics, not even her own sister. Elizabeth Tudor was also the daughter of King Henry VIII with his second wife, Anne Boleyn, whom Henry had married after divorcing Catherine of Aragon the mother of Queen Mary. When she was installed as queen, she put her sister, Elizabeth I, in jail because she was suspected of being a Protestant, so she went to the Tower of London. While imprisoned in the tower, Elizabeth formed a friendship with a mysterious member of the court, a mathematician and mystic named Dr. John Dee. He was known in the early Elizabethan days as, as the real wise man, the Magus. Um, and he was into a lot of esoteric study. Um, you know, he, he, he was certainly an initiate of the wisdom traditions. Dr. John Dee was one of the foremost geniuses of his day. John Dee was 34 years older than Francis Bacon. And um, John Dee was a mathematician, lived in London. He was a mathematician and astrologer to Queen Mary Tudor. Uh, that's Bloody Mary. While Dee began in Mary's service, he soon fell out of favor because of his bizarre experiments, and some say his friendship with Elizabeth. In any case, Dee was imprisoned under suspicion of sorcery, an accusation that would follow him throughout his life and one that seems not unfounded, considering his system of magic is still practiced by many occultists to this day. One thing that he is most noted for today among occultists is that he and a fellow named Edward Kelly, who was a medium, uh, did magical invocations uh, related to the Book of Enoch to produce an entire what today is called the Nakian system of magic. And it's this incredibly complex language and uh, alphabet and cubes and magic squares and it's, it's extremely complex and it's very, very powerful. In his quest for knowledge, Dee tapped into the powers of the beyond, hoping to learn secrets from the spirit realm. But that's not to say he wasn't trying to communicate with angels, he did. And they can be contacted and talked with. They're, roughly it means messengers of God. So that's what Dee was trying to do in his own way. But um, he obviously was too open about it, so in the end he got uh, persecuted for this. But not everyone saw Dee's dabbling as communicating with angels of God. Dee once wrote that he was looked upon as a companion of hellhounds, a caller and a conjurer of wicked and damned spirits. Yet like Bacon, he practiced much of his craft in secret as an active member of the Rosicrucians in England. Some even credit Dee 
with founding the modern Rosicrucian movement. As such, communing with angelic beings that provide scientific knowledge was a familiar practice. Now, there was a, a pretty, uh, very brief and shady dividing line between what they called scientific knowledge and what we might call outright witchcraft today. It was a, the, the demarcation there was very shadowy. This shadowy line was one that Dee crossed many times. Yet for a while, he flourished under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. During this era, some believe that he was a kind of mentor to Sir Francis Bacon. Well, we know from Dee's diary that Bacon made one visit, at least, to um, Dr. John Dee's home at Mortlake. And when, when these visits were recorded, Dee was meaning people had come to talk with Dee and discuss esoteric matters with him and to use his library and so on like that. So we know that that's a historical record we have. O otherwise, it's, it's circumstantial evidence. Um, B Bacon clearly knew Dr John Dee because he was an important person in Queen Elizabeth's court and Francis Bacon was a courtier. Perhaps the reason for the lack of records in Bacon's relationship with John Dee is that their work was done behind the veil of secret societies. There's always been these secret societies trying to promote learning and, um, and raise the level of people's thought and culture to a kinder level and higher level. But mostly they've worked in secret because the church, most, most of the different churches have been so um, well, not very kind. The problem we're dealing with here is that Europeans discovered an awful lot of information and very important, good, solid information of sciences that had been, you know, developed richly elsewhere and that were brought into Europe and were so threatening to Christianity that they had to be suppressed. We know what happened to Galileo. And, and we know what happened to endless numbers of uh, Giordano, Bruno, and so many others uh, in science. They had to go underground. So, so the process of forcing knowledge and wisdom underground uh, created a lot of coding and a lot of buzzwords and a lot of secret gestures and, and, and terms that still aren't understood to this day. So D is amongst that group. While men such as Galileo were persecuted for representing scientific knowledge, the secret societies of the Elizabethan era were in danger not for the knowledge they possessed, but how they obtained it through occult practices of summoning spirits and conjuring demons. They were nevertheless determined to continue for the cause of science and learning. Dr. John Dee led the way in this arena his method became known as angel magic because of his contact with spirits that Dee believed were sometimes good and sometimes evil. At one point, Dee's angels compelled him to visit the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, and tell him that he was wicked and that if he did not repent, God would throw him down. Incredibly, Dee obeyed the angels visited the emperor and established a friendship that would help to protect him from persecution later on. In his experiments, Dee worked with a medium named Edward Kelly. Kelly was the one who often made contact with the spirits Dee communed with. In a diary entry of June 8, 1584, Dee records a startling account. He claims that Kelly was greatly troubled when the angels tried to persuade him that Jesus was not God and that no prayers ought to be made to him. They further claimed that sin did not really exist and that man's soul simply moves from one body to another in what sounds like reincarnation. Upon hearing this, Kelly was apparently distraught and believed they had contacted evil spirits. Nevertheless, the angels provided Dr. D with gifts of knowledge.
Dee was the first to apply Euclidean geometry to navigation. He built the instruments for and trained the first great navigators. He is credited with coining the word Britannia or Britain and his influence laid the foundation for what would become the British Empire. He made his own maps and is said to have charted the northeast and northwest passages in his attempts to increase the wealth of England by gaining access to the New World. And believe it or not, the New World has been secretly influenced by his example. John Dee is considered the original wizard. He was the inspiration for the character of Prospero in Shakespeare's The Tempest and for Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. In the modern world, Dee was the role model for J.K. Rowling's Albus Dumbledore in the Harry Potter books, the character of Gandalf in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and even Ian Fleming's James Bond. Few people know that John Dee was the original Agent 007 in Her Majesty's Secret Service. Ian Fleming got the idea for his designation 007 for James Bond from the fact that that was how John Dee would sign his correspondence when he was overseas working as a spy for Queen Elizabeth. He would always sign his name 007. And that's where the concept came in for James Bond. Because he was, James Bond was originally intended to be kind of a modern day Dr. John Dee, although it never really developed that way. While Dee's character continues to intrigue, some would argue that compelling the imaginations of literary minds was not his greatest influence. This image shows what appears to be a wizened old man passing a lamp in the dead of night to a younger man in Elizabethan clothing. Baconians believe this old world engraving represents Dr. John Dee passing the lamp of esoteric knowledge and wisdom to his successor, Francis Bacon. Both Bacon and Dee were men of science, dedicated to the advancement of learning. Both men were members of the Rosicrucian Society, of which Bacon would become the chief. Like Bacon, John Dee believed that America was indeed the lost continent of Atlantis. But where did he get this idea? Was it given to him by his angels? And did he pass this concept on to Francis Bacon? We can only speculate. But when Queen Elizabeth took the throne, the dream of colonizing this new Atlantis would come closer to being a reality. When Bloody Mary, as she was called, this was Mary Tudor who had been now on the throne and persecuting the Christians and she died perhaps ironically, with a false pregnancy. And so when she died in 1558, and then after that, Elizabeth I came in as queen. And so uh, there were questions of what day should be chosen for Elizabeth's um, coronation. The coronation of a new ruler was an important event, the timing of which, it was believed, could determine the success or failure of a monarch's reign. To ensure her good fortune, Elizabeth called upon her old friend, Dr. John Dee. He, he was the Queen's astrologer, too. He, he computed the date for her to be crowned. And... Astrology in those days didn't mean necessarily what we understand it to mean today. Uh, there were some odd things about it, but there was a study of the stars what we, that we would call today astronomy. So they had to know about the movements of the stars and the planets, and, and they were pretty knowledgeable about that. So it was a strange mixture of astrology and astronomy. So that's what he was doing. It's debatable how the efforts of Dee's astrology impacted the course of England. But when the new queen took the throne, it marked the beginning of an unprecedented era in English history. During this time, the language of the new world would be transformed ancient knowledge would unfold and the course of the philosophic empire would be established. The modern world would be changed forever, largely because of Queen Elizabeth I.
And she was bright. This was Queen Elizabeth of England, one of the brightest queens that uh, England has ever had. Whether she was a true Christian or not was perhaps doubtful, but she, at least she did support the Protestant cause and not the Catholic one. The Queen's Protestant faith made her immediate enemies in Rome. In April of 1570, Pope Pius V issued a papal bull excommunicating her from, quote, the unity of the body of Christ. Well, that meant that the Pope was saying to all the Catholic kings of Europe, go and invade England, kill the Queen, take over the country, make it Catholic, and I'll give you my blessing. So that was a huge threat to England and the Queen. So the, the English, who didn't like that, <laughs> didn't like that idea, they, they formed a close knit protection around the Queen and their country. To answer the threat of spies and assassins from Rome, the English set up an intelligence network under the leadership of Sir Francis Walsingham, known as the Queen's Spy Master. Among his secret agents were Dr. John Dee and later on Sir Francis Bacon, along with their Rosicrucian Society, which is said to have been formed in England for the purpose of protecting Elizabeth. But some suspect the Order of the Rose and Cross had yet another agenda. I think they would have definitely been on the, the Protestant side of things. They would have had a vested interest in using all of their both political savvy and occult savvy, savvy to protect the Queen. But I also think they had an esoteric agenda as well. This, this society had a very esoteric base. It, behind it, it had links with the wisdom societies, the wisdom traditions throughout Europe, and inherited a lot of that, that, that wisdom light being passed on. And so they had an inner program which was to try to raise consciousness of society. According to Bacon, Rosicrucianism seemed to represent the very heart and focus of the entire New Atlantis concept. Francis Bacon's last book that he was writing at the time when he allegedly died that was 1626, but his last book was called The New Atlantis, and the subtitle was The Land of the Rosicruce. Why the land of the Rosicruce, or Rosicrucians? Why did Bacon deem their influence to be so important? Rosicrucianism gets its name from the symbols, the main symbols used, um, and that's the rose and the cross. But these are very ancient symbols, they go back long, long, long way in time and been used by different societies for thousands of years. In the hands of different societies, the symbol has been interpreted in a variety of ways. There is the decipherment of the rose that received much attention in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. The rose is a symbol of secrecy and the term in Latin that uh, characterized the relationship of the rose to secrecy was sub rosa, meaning under the rose. So secret orders world round, uh, when they swear to secrecy, swear sub rosa. The secrecy of the rose represents the hidden knowledge of the ancient mystery religion, while the cross symbolizes Christianity. The combining of these two is what defines the belief of nearly all the secret orders. The symbology there is the infusion of all this Eastern Persian uh, uh, spirituality into Christianity. Was this fusion of beliefs a part of Bacon's plan? And what sort of impact could it have? The reformers argued that the mixture of paganism and Christianity is what produced the Dark Ages. Would Bacon's program of the Rose and Cross be a blessing or a curse? And how would this whole thing be carried out? When one follows the Rosicrucian trail, John Dee was a very, very key influence in the historical Rosicrucians, and some say even the, the, you know, the founder of it, the fir first president of it. The, but at some point, the, the presidency was given over to Francis Bacon. 
And he was in charge of the Rosicrucians, not just in England, but it spread right through Europe. And was following his, Bacon's particular program. And Bacon's, outwardly Bacon called his program the advancement of proficiency of learning. This advancement of learning represented Bacon's desire to transform the world through knowledge. But he recognized that the key to obtaining knowledge was in a people's ability to communicate. As such, Bacon worked to reform the English language in ways never before realized. And it is a bit strange that the English language, as crude as it was, in the time of Bacon's youth. By the time he died, it was becoming one of the most refined languages. But in England at that time, the English was dreadful. It was garbled with all kinds of different dialects, because if you think about it, England was made up of the Saxons, the Danes, the Gauls who had invaded, they were the Frenchmen, and they had a whole mixture of languages. So very often, one Englishman could not communicate with another. To address the problem, Bacon surrounded himself with writers and poets who were like-minded. All these people, these, these kind of intellectual people, they all read and wrote in Latin, but they, they said, look, we need an English language. We're going to be a great country. So they needed a language and literature. So how to develop that, lit that, that, uh, that skill? And that's what, um, I think that's principally what Bacon did. He, he gathered around him a literary society you know, writers, poets, artists as well. And, um, and some of them were employed to, um, as, as part of the secret service of Queen Elizabeth. And they had communications with people all over Europe, in all the different countries of Europe. And from their letters, they derived the roots of new English words, which they invented and put out. These new words were put out through a variety of literary works books and poems and plays of the theater. Bacon's circle of writers and poets were largely responsible for the explosion of English literature during the Elizabethan era. They included such notable authors as Ben Jonson, Christopher Marlowe, Sir Walter Raleigh, and Edmund Spencer, to name a few. In addition, Bacon was dedicated to bringing the sacred knowledge of the ancient world to English-speaking people knowledge otherwise kept hidden by the barriers of language. When he died, and subsequent to that, they've culled together at least 2,000 books, that he, not books that he wrote, because obviously one man couldn't write that number, but he had a, what he called a scriptorium. These were scribes who he paid to write for him. When he was the Lord High Chancellor of England, um, he had wealth, and he used to pay the scriptorium, these scribes, and he paid people to translate the classic books, Homer's Iliad, uh, all the old Greek, um, the Roman classics, and all those classics, Livy, cl uh, translate them all into English and put them in books. It turns out too that Bacon had a printing press. He had a factory with using brass plates for printing. That was his own thing. Nobody knew about that until rather recently. <laughs> But nevertheless, there were 2,000 works that we know of that passed through his hands in one way or another to give literacy to the English public, printing presses to make these books available to many people at a cheap price. But Bacon's purpose and that of his literary society was to prepare the people of the old world to colonize the land of the new. As the term colonization scheme suggests, the launching of Bacon's plan for America was not by chance, but by design. It could be said that his great scheme began at an early age, perhaps when he was sent by Queen Elizabeth I to the court of France, where he was inspired by the example of the French poets. Another major influence, he obviously was inspired in France by the French Pleiades, the group of French poets who were deliberately trying to make the French language into a really good language, particularly for poetry and, and, and um, writings and so on of that sort. And Bacon spent several years at the French court, came back very inspired and wanted to do the same thing for the English language. Upon his return to England, 
he was sent to study law at the prestigious Gray's Inn in London, where his statue can be seen today. It was here that Bacon formed the beginnings of his own literary society, a secret group known as the Knights of the Helmet. The Knights, Knights of the Helmet were actually, it's actually the name of a mask he wrote, um, or it's thought he must have written, because um, masks were put together by a lot of people uh, for the royal court or for the inns of court, which was where the lawyers were. And to get, get a job as a lawyer or um, a, a minister or official in the government, you had to be, a law, first of all, a lawyer, and you had to know how the royal court worked. So every year they had to put on huge celebrations imitating the royal court, and part of that celebration was masks. And many people um, were involved in creating these entertainments with their masks. Francis Bacon was just one of them, but he became a key one and he wrote quite a lot of the, of, of the mask material, which one can identify. You know, once you, once you get to know Bacon and his writings, you can identify what was done. And he's acclaimed uh, by the lawyers as being the great, great one who inspired them and led them and wrote for them, you know. Um, but, but the, Knight of the Hel Knights of the Helmets was the name of one of the masks at a key moment when the whole Shakespeare authorship uh, the name of the Shakespeare was being used for the first time. The Knights of the Helmet took as their inspiration the Greek goddess Pallas Athena, who carried a spear and who wore a great helmet, a symbol of secrecy. According to tradition, one that wears the helmet of Athena becomes invisible. And they had to swear allegiance to it. And not only that, Athena, the goddess Athena, carried a spear that she shook in the eyes of ignorance. And she was one of the greatest goddesses among the Greeks, ruling through intellect and man's wisdom. Even as Dr. John Dee had been inspired by angelic beings, some researchers believe that a spiritual encounter with Pallas Athena gave Bacon the inspiration for his life's work. Well, in some of those cipher writings that he had written, he, he writes there how this, um, he heard a heavenly voice. The voice he heard inspired him towards secrecy and to imitate the work of God. The divine majesty takes delight to hide his work, according to the innocent play of children. Surely for thee to follow the example of the most high God cannot be censored. Therefore, put away popular applause, and after the manner of Solomon, the king, compose a history of thy time, and fold it into enigmatical writings and cunning mixtures of the theater. That was his mission in life. And for the rest of Bacon's life, he, d he was dedicated to that one purpose. Baconian scholars believe that Bacon's revelation led him to develop a series of theatrical works that would teach the English people and transform them into a nation that could one day dominate the world and resurrect the Atlantean dream. Believing that he put away popular applause as his heavenly voice had commanded, he is said to have written behind the identity of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare is a synonym for Apollo and Pallas Athena. They're both known as shakers of the spear in classical tradition. And the spear represents a ray of light, a ray of wisdom. And they shake that spear at the dragon of ignorance. Exactly what Ben Jonson says in the, his preface to the Shakespeare folio, um, to shake a lance at the dragon of ignorance. And, and, and this, this is the role of an, of an Apollo or Pallas Athena. And they, they have always been the, the muses of, of the other nine muses, who themselves are the muses of all the writers, poets, artists, and so on in, in, in history. So, so Apollo and Athena are the great inspirers. They're the great Shakespeare's. Bacon incorporated these Greek gods within a key symbol, the double A headpiece representing Apollo and Athena. Usually one of the A's is shaded, denoting a light and dark side. This symbol is found printed at the head of certain pages within the Shakespeare folio and among the acknowledged works of Francis Bacon. Of the two polarities, Apollo and Athena, it was Athena that seemed to dominate Bacon's imagination. 
palace Athena was uh, she shook her spear at the eyes of ignorance. So she was the spear shaker. Now, she's always been known as the spear shaker. That was long before the time of Bacon. Back to the Greeks, the, the spear shaker. Uh, so he took that name, spear shaker, and just turned it around to make it Shakespeare. And it used to be written with a hyphen, and then it became one word, Shakespeare, as the name of the playwright for those Shakespearean plays. But what of the real William Shakespeare, the Stratford man whose name has been revered for nearly 500 years? His writings have been attributed to a number of other authors, including the playwright Christopher Marlowe, Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, and even Queen Elizabeth herself. But Sir Francis Bacon seems to lead the pack of would-be bards, with well over 200 books, essays, and pamphlets on the subject, many of which insist he is the real and true Shakespeare. Meanwhile, Baconian scholars argue that the Stratford man simply lacked the experience and education to have written the works that bear his name. There is a mystery because when you look at the plays, everything that's in them and, and what lies behind them in terms of experience, uh, knowledge and so on like that's expressed through the plays and the philosophy in the plays and so on like that, they do not match up with what we know of the life of the actor. In fact, the life of the actor uh, is quite well known. It's, you know, it's quite a lot of research been done on William Shakespeare Stratford. So a lot is known about his life and none of it matches up what you can deduce from the author from the plays themselves. In fact, the more we find out about the life of the actor, the, the, more, the worse it gets. Here you have a guy who, who is barely literate enough to make a mark, much less write his name. He, he, his mark was only existent in five documents. There's not a single letter either from him or to him by any of his contemporaries. How can this guy have written the greatest literary works in the history of the world? It just didn't happen. Whoever was the author certainly knew about certain things happening abroad in the royal courts, uh, in France, in Italy, and in Spain. Not only taught the workings of the court, but the intrigues as well, and who would know that? Certainly not a play actor like uh, the William Shakespeare. There's no way that man could have known the intrigues that went on inside the court. But Francis Bacon did. He was well familiar with it. He was brought up in the court. You can't just say, oh, genius did it all. It's impossible for genius alone to do that. You've got to have all that background, experience, knowledge, and so on. Um, to get something like the Shakespeare plays. Uh, there's, there's even a quote from uh, one of the justices, one of the en English justices, that it's clear that from the Shakespeare writings that uh, the author had to be an attorney because there is not a single legal error contained in any of them. He writes, the author writes naturally as if he's a lawyer. You know, it doesn't just put in legal terms here and there just to suit the story. It just legal terms and, and the whole legal jargon just rolls off him absolutely naturally as if he, he's, he's used to living in that environment all the time. Well that doesn't fit the actor from Stratford. There's just no way the historic William Shakespeare could have written these plays. There's only one person who could have uh, could possibly be the author of those plays which is Francis Bacon. Yet wouldn't the colossal size of all the plays, poems and sonnets be too much for Bacon himself to complete, especially while becoming a lawyer, launching modern science, and writing the many other works attributed to him. This could be where the Knights of the Helmet took part, as evidence suggests that the plays may have been the collective effort of Bacon's literary society. We know from historical records that Bacon actually had a literary group around him. Some of them were actually paid, employed by him, and others just did it voluntarily. A big group. Why? You know, why did he do that? You know, you don't employ a lot, a lot of people, or, or writers, poets, artists, and um, as well as cipher experts and so on. You don't employ them for nothing. So, so what, what did they do? And then you get the answer the Shakespeare plays, because scholars have found out there's been other contributions in the plays from other poets and so on, have all put a little bit in here and there. 
and then you find that they were either associated with or employed by Bacon um, in that group. They're all part of this, this one group. So then the picture emerges of a, of a typical Renaissance studio, but instead of being an artist, a, pa a painter with his studio of pupils, you've got a writer with his studio of pupils working with him. They each contribute a little bit to the picture or the story, but the main, the main artist or author is Francis Bacon himself. But in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon, people come from all over the world to view the birthplace of the man considered to be the greatest literary mind of all time. In Stratford, they hold a strong view against the suggestion that Shakespeare was anyone but himself. It's a conspiracy theory, and it's all aimed at toppling the greatest writer who's ever lived. There is a Shakespearean trust in England, and these are people who are dedicated to the cause of supporting and maintaining that William Shakespeare, the actor, was the actual playwright. I think it's highly unlikely. Dr. Paul Edmondson is the head of education at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. In this debate, he is known as a Stratfordian, not just because of where he lives, but because of his traditional view of Shakespeare. The Stratfordians are considered the academic adversaries of Baconians. We asked Dr. Edmondson to comment on the Bacon-Shakespeare theory. It first occurred in 1785. A, a, a vicar just outside Stratford um, got to the age of 80, and then there's some report of him burning the papers that he'd been working on, as if in his later years he just kind of renounced any theory that he had about Bacon. It was taken up in 1856 by, what a surprise, Delia Bacon, no descendant, but she wanted to prove that Bacon wrote the plays. She even went as far as um, having her herself locked in Holy Trinity Church to dig up the grave of Shakespeare, convinced that some manuscripts would have been inside the grave saying, I did not write uh, the plays, it was Bacon instead. And uh, she didn't get as far as digging um, up the, the corpse of Shakespeare. And um, later she went mad after the publication of her book. But her, her book was groundbreaking. She had good support from, from um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain. She knew literary figures in, in the States. Mark Twain was certainly convinced uh, that the historic William Shakespeare did not write the Shakespeare plays. Uh, and, and this is a guy, how can, you, how can you deny his conclusions? He had the money to investigate it, he had the time to investigate it. He's not known as a crackpot in any other venue. In 1909, Twain took up the Bacon-Shakespeare controversy with his own book titled, Is Shakespeare Dead? in which he questions the reputation of the Stratford actor in his lifetime. He's saying that in Shakespeare's own life, no one regarded him as being important or famous or a brilliant uh, playwright or anything like that. It was only uh, two or three generations after his death that suddenly the historic William Shakespeare became a big deal. So if, if the, the, however, the plays enjoyed immediate success and immediate prominence. So how do you explain that? That, that's simply not true. There's all sorts of evidence that he died and that he was remembered after his death. First of all, there's the very significant memorial bust in Holy Trinity Church, which not only is an early likeness of Shakespeare to give us a sense of what the man actually looked like, but it also mentions him as a great writer on the inscription of the monument, see living art but paid to, say, to, to, to serve his wit, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but it mentions living art and looking at the page rather than the monument, which is an echo of, um, or prefigures possibly, the um, commendatory verse of Ben Jonson, Shakespeare's friend and contemporary playwright, at the front of the first folio. The first folio is the um, first time Shakespeare's works are, are gathered together after his death by his friends, that's crucial. What is equally crucial is that the two tributes mentioned by Dr. Edmondson did not come about until years after Shakespeare's death. Other great writers of the time, like poet Ben Jonson, were given more immediate recognition within months of their passing. 
just as importantly, the great folio assembled by Shakespeare's friends seven years after his death contains what many believe to be some important clues. 19th century author W.F.C. Wigston referred to William Shakespeare as Phantom Captain Shakespeare, the Rosicrucian Mask. This may have been partly due to the world-famous Drochout portrait that appears on the front of the original Great Folio of 1623. Note the presence of a line extending from the jawline of Shakespeare to the bottom of his left ear, as if to suggest the face were simply a mask. If this seems far-fetched, consider the dedication which appears beside it, written by poet Ben Jonson, a friend of both Shakespeare and Sir Francis Bacon. With a rather mysterious twist, Jonson concludes with the words, Reader, look not on his picture, but his book. Why would Ben Jonson point the reader away from the face of Shakespeare and compel men to look upon the book instead? a dedication that seems to parallel the monument at Holy Trinity Church. On the inscription of the monument, see living art, but page to, say, to, to, to serve his wit, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, but it mentions living art and looking at the page rather than the monument. Are these illusions made by the men who knew the real William Shakespeare, that he was simply a mask or front man for Francis Bacon? Bacon paid him off to go and keep his mouth shut. The monument at Holy Trinity Church refers to the page that serves Shakespeare's wit. But when one looks upon the page beneath his hand, it turns out to be blank. Some Baconians believe this is a secret code, alerting the reader that the Stratford man himself wrote nothing. The empty page is said to match the empty expression on the face of Shakespeare, who Baconians argue could barely write his name. It's actually a big embarrassment to, um, you could say, the academic fraternity that believe the actor wrote the plays. The question of Shakespeare's literacy is often mentioned because of the few known signatures he left behind. As one writer puts it, the scrawling, uncertain method of their execution stamped Shakespeare as unfamiliar with the use of a pen. Perhaps a, a modern um, equivalent of this is to say, you know, how good is your signature on your credit card? How good is your signature when you sign your name um, in a shop or uh, on, on, a, on a, a bank transaction or, or whatever? Um, there are several signatures which survive of Shakespeare. How good would you like them to be? While Baconians argue that Shakespeare lacked experience, Edmondson points out that, as the son of a glove maker, he was uniquely qualified. Um, there's lots of references to different kinds of leather. For example, it's, um, uh, Feste's line in Act 3, Scene 1 of Twelfth Night about somebody's being, someone's wit being like a chevril glove. Chevril, as the son of a glove maker, Shakespeare would have known, is a kind of kid skin which stretches and stretches and stretches when you're making the gloves. It's a very soft, supple material to work with. And here you have it um, immersed in the wordplay of one of Shakespeare's clowns. Francis Bacon knew nothing about different kinds of leather, I would suggest. Um, actually, you could turn this whole thing on its head and say that Shakespeare wrote Bacon, which is something, is something that a lot of people don't suggest, because why bother to do it that way around? One of the problems is the um, Shakespearean trust is that while these objections come up to um, William Shakespeare being the author of the plays, they refuse to investigate the contrary evidence which has been put forward to them. They refuse to look into it. They refuse to look into the cipher codes that Bacon incorporated in the first folios, for instance. Bacon uses this cipher in, in the Shakespeare work and his own, uh, and in the work under his own name. Uh, but he also, in doing that, signs his name and the name of the Rosicrucian fraternity. This code system of writing he used all his entire life. The examination of the cipher codes in Shakespeare's plays have filled hundreds of books and essays over the last few centuries. 
but perhaps the most specific evidence are the presence of Baconian and Rosicrucian emblems in the Great Folio of 1623 and in earlier works by Shakespeare. Bacon's Light A and Dark A symbol appears, representing the two Shakespeare's, Apollo and Athena. Meanwhile, this Rosicrucian emblem featuring the god Pan is found prominently throughout the work. Other mystical headpieces with Rosicrucian symbolism are found both in the Shakespeare Folio of 1623 and in works openly published by Sir Francis Bacon. The varied symbols and ciphers clearly mark the presence of Bacon and his Rosicrucian fraternity, while to what extent they were involved in the writing of the plays remains a matter of debate. But perhaps the most compelling evidence is that the works of Shakespeare helped to accomplish exactly what Bacon and his Knights of the Helmet set out to achieve. While the numbers vary, the plays are said to have developed some 20,000 words for the English language, with some words being created, older words being revived, and current words being used in new ways. Could the actor from Stratford, with a limited education, have accomplished this coincidentally? The Shakespeare controversy was illustrated quite clearly by Masonic author Manly P. Hall in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, where he reveals the veiled purpose behind the writing of the plays. He says, Sir Francis Bacon, the Rosicrucian initiate, wrote into the Shakespearean plays the secret teachings of the fraternity of the Rose and Cross and the true rituals of the Masonic order. The Bacon-Shakespeare controversy involves the most profound aspects of science, religion, and ethics. He who solves its mystery may yet find therein the key to the supposedly lost wisdom of antiquity. The lost wisdom that Hall refers to is said to have begun in ancient Atlantis. Is this the real key to understanding Shakespeare? Incredibly, it may be said that the plays themselves represent the whole confusion of America's foundation. For while Shakespeare contains a clear representation of Christianity, with some 1,200 biblical references, along with them are plays with openly pagan and magical themes. Like the symbol of the rose and cross, the plays combine the teachings of Christianity with the wisdom of the mystery religion. The purpose in blending religions in this way might have been to avoid the wars and conflicts that have afflicted men over the centuries. Bacon, who saw religious persecution in his own day, may have inherited this view from an earlier Masonic influence, the Knights Templar. The whole episode of the fall of the Knights Templar is a matter of, of conflicting historical controversy. We do know uh, that when they left the, the Holy Land. Uh, the order had increased in numbers and power, and by the beginning of the 1200s, uh, they had returned to uh, Europe, and the Knights Templar then became the dominant financial force in Europe. The Templars were the people that loaned the money. Well, of course, the popes and people to whom the money was, uh, uh, they owned the money, they could get rid of their debt by getting rid of the Templars, and they did. But in addition to the issue of debt, the Templars were accused for embracing certain religious doctrines they had picked up during their time in the Holy Land. It is said they began to combine the teachings of Christianity with the influence of Islam and Judaism, as well as spin-off cults known as the Yazidi and the Hashashin. What people did not understand is they had adopted uh, the 
teachings of the ancient esoteric religions. And they were decreed by the Pope in 1308 in Europe and 1309 in England that the Templars should be disbanded, if not hunted down and killed. Many Templars were tortured under the Inquisition and even burned at the stake for heresy. But some of them escaped. And a lot of them, I think, went underground because by no means did the dragnet, if you will, capture all of them. A lot of them fled to Scotland. They had to go into hiding. And one of the places they found to hide was the um, Masonic Lodge. There's no question but that the Knights Templar are the real fulcrum of the latter development of Freemasonry. And that's not saying that Freemasonry did not pre-exist the Knights Templar. It did, as the builders, as guilds of builders throughout Europe. It is from the influence of the Knights Templar that many believe Masonry began to develop its modern philosophy. A philosophy literally carved in stone and found in one of the most intriguing monuments of the Western world. Just outside of Edinburgh, Scotland, is the Rossland Chapel, a place that may well provide a door to understanding Masonry, the Knights Templar, and the ancient plan for America. It very conclusively demonstrates a profound relationship between uh, Scotland and the Templars and the Freemasons, uh, which is not really any big revelation. Um, but of course the whole idea is that, is that the three things go together. The chapel was built in the 15th century by William Sinclair. The tomb of his ancestor of the same name and who died a century earlier is found within. His name as it appears, William Sinclair, Knight Templar, is believed to be a link between the Templars and the Scottish Masons who built this mysterious chapel. The chapel was, the foundation stone was laid in 1446 and it was finished about 1492. So it took 50 odd years to build. And the interesting fact is that um, William Sinclair, the builder, was 50 when the job started and he died when it stopped. So this man was uniquely old because in medieval times you wouldn't expect to live perhaps more than 35 years or so. But William Sinclair was into his 90s, so he was a remarkable character all the way around. Everything about him was remarkable, including the legacy he's left us. The legacy of Rosslyn Chapel seems to be the very essence of the Templar belief and that of secret societies everywhere. The removal of all boundaries concerning world religion. As noted before, this Gnostic theme is well captured in Dan Brown's best-selling book, The Da Vinci Code, a work that has created worldwide controversy. During our visit to Rosslyn Chapel, we encountered Erwin Lutzer, author of the book, The Da Vinci Deception. Of course, as we know, Rosslyn Chapel has become famous because of the Da Vinci Code. And you have people coming from all over the world, staring at its ceilings, trying to crack its codes. As we walk through it, it's very probable that the Masons who built it had a field day. Uh, they decided that they were going to combine all kinds of uh, mythological elements along with the Bible. So you have uh, Masonic elements in the chapel, you have some pagan elements, you have Christian elements, and they're all thrown together. Roslyn Chapel is probably one of the most extraordinary buildings in the world. Uh, it is like a Disneyland of masonry and Rosicrucianism. I think the chapel is an enigma. It satisfies the needs of a great number of people who come to Roslyn for a, a whole raft of reasons. If you're a, a Knight Templar or a Freemason, if you are an American looking for some links with the New World before it was discovered, if you're a Sinclair, if you're religious or a, an art historian or an architectural historian, an esoteric, Roslyn has got something for you. If you're a paganist, we have over 110 green men. Most churches will have one or two green men, but we have over 100 of them. The green man is a representation of an ancient fertility god, just one of the many pagan icons in the chapel. And so Roslyn, not only does it offer a great many things to different people, but it also offers a mystery. 
The mystery, he explains, is that Rosslyn Chapel, while designed as a Christian church, is filled with so many religious symbols, a person is confused about what they are compelled to worship. It's like, it's like having a VCR. You know pretty much what it's meant to do, but you can't actually make it work properly. No one can follow the instructions. And the chapel is like that. We know it's a church. That's fair enough. But it has so many other little stories connected with it and mysteries, and the carvings are not particularly clear. And they can be interpreted one way or another. And so for everything you see in the chapel, there's probably three answers. And that, I think, is its great appeal. Centuries after its construction, researchers continue to question the overarching message of the chapel. What was the intent of its design? It may have had a point for the masons who made it in the sense that uh, there were various messages that were conveyed. Essentially, masonry's doctrine foundationally, and they will even say this publicly, is universalism, which is the idea that basically all religions are the same. It doesn't matter what religion you are, as long as you're sincere and devout in your beliefs, and that, that all, all men, they say, may gather at the hospitable altars of masonry no matter what their religious belief. So in that sense, they're very much part of, of pushing toward a one world religion and to, to, view, to view biblical Christianity as basically the enemy. Because biblical Christianity makes unique, unique claims about itself that, that none of these other groups, the Rosicrucians, the Masons, any of these groups, will acknowledge. Some of us are convinced it's important that Christianity be held distinct from some of the elements that are found here in Rosalind Chapel. After all, the message of Jesus Christ is very, very unique. But throughout history, you've always found those who want to blend together various ideas, various organizations, and various religions. And here at the Roslyn Chapel, people can come and they can practically see anything that they want. But within the monument is evidence, not only of what the Templars and Masons came to believe, but perhaps a reflection of things to come. The promise of a land where one day their ancient hope might be fulfilled. For inside Rosslyn Chapel, along with the haunting imagery, is evidence of the new world prior to the discovery of Columbus. Well, there is, uh, there is this window which, uh, which is decorated, uh, the window frame is decorated with Indian corn or maize, and the chapel was built in the 15th century. So it is, it is strange that Indian corn, which wasn't ever uh, grown here, uh, is used as a motif. The chapel was finished around 1492, the same year Columbus is thought to have come to America. This would mean the carvings would have been completed beforehand. But how did the Masons who built this chapel have knowledge of Indian corn, a crop not grown in Europe and indigenous to the New World? Who knows? There are lots of mysteries about this chapel. Another mystery is the presence of Aloha cactus plants, also indigenous to America, and like the Indian corn carved along the arches of the chapel. But even with these, academics have been skeptical. Yet a third carving, a trefoil plant, or type of clover, is said by Rosslyn Chapel director Stuart Beatty to have convinced one skeptic in particular. The, the trefoil plant is quite interesting. Um, Roslyn Chapel does have carvings of plants that we believe came from the New World before Columbus discovered America. Uh, we've, we've had these plants investigated and a botanist from the university had a good look at them and he, he wasn't particularly convinced as academics need to be, he wasn't 100% sure that these plants were in fact aloha cactus and sweet corn. And I think his, his logic was that the, the people who went to the New World and recorded these images on parchment brought those images back. They would have been translated to wood and then subsequently translated to stone. And it's that process which removes them from the original two or three times, which means that there are discrepancies that can build in. And so being an academic, 
he, he was uncomfortable with these images. And um, when looking around the chapel, he suddenly, his, his eyes lit up and he came and got me and he said, whilst I was fairly unsure about the sweet corn and aloe cactus as being honestly genuine, I have found a trefoil plant on what would have been the outside of the chapel at the time, but is now the baptistry, that would only have been found in the new world. Therefore, I am much more comfortable to say that the other plants are also honest and true. When the Templars were arrested in Europe, many of them are said to have escaped with a great fleet of ships that were never to be found. Could they have made their way to the New World? If so, they could have handed down this knowledge through secret societies to men like Francis Bacon and before him, Christopher Columbus. Some, some people believe that Columbus didn't just accidentally stumble onto America, that uh, some secret society which he had access to uh, had knowledge of the existence of, uh, of the continent of both North and South America. Was Christopher Columbus a member of a secret order? Some researchers point to this painting that depicts Columbus with his left hand in a Kabbalistic gesture, denoting the left-hand path of the initiate, meaning the path of darkness or secrecy. In addition, the ships of Columbus sailed to the New World adorned with red crosses on a white background, the symbol of the Knights Templar. Columbus's wife was the daughter of a famous Knights Templar line that passed along what are called Porto lands and cartographs that Columbus had direct access to. And we know that he robbed the Portuguese and brought all of those Porto lands to Isabella and Ferdinand. Um, what I'm suggesting is that there, uh, people knew about this new Atlantis. They, they knew at the time of Columbus and before the time of Columbus. But did the secret societies involved view the new world as Atlantis of old? And if so, from where did they develop this idea? Was it only from Plato's account? Or from a belief more deeply rooted in America's secret history? In his groundbreaking book, America B.C., Harvard professor Barry Fell reveals the presence of ancient Europeans in New England and the American Midwest as far back as 800 B.C. The author uncovers evidence of ancient Celts and Druids with travelers from Spain, Libya, Carthage, Rome, and Egypt, all of whom came to the New World centuries prior to its so-called discovery by Columbus. His research exposes that the all-seeing eye was present in places like Vermont and New Hampshire long before the new order of the ages was declared. Does this stand as proof that America was indeed known by the ancients and that its destiny has been the plan of secret societies from long ago? Sir Francis Bacon believed it was his mission to reform the world in preparation for building paradise on earth, to lead mankind into a new age. And Bacon himself called, called himself the herald of the new age, which is the title of Elijah. And, and in tradition, Elijah is said to come again and again to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah or coming of the Christ, which has many different interpretations. As shown before, the Masonic Christ is perceived as the hypotenuse in the 47th proposition of Euclid. This rare Pythagorean symbol is found among the Masonic regalia of the fourth Earl of Rosslyn, whose family owns the Rosslyn Chapel. Oddly enough, this same emblem forms the heart of the design for Washington, D.C., known as the La Infante Triangle. Masonic author David Ovison claims that the entire city of Washington is based around this Pythagorean theorem. 
If so, America's capital might stand as the ultimate dedication to Bacon's great plan, a city designed symbolically to represent the Masonic Christ that Bacon came to herald. If these things are so, what can this mean for the secret destiny of America?